the meaning of life? Yeah. I, I don't know. Find out when I get there, I suppose. If we didn't have to compare ourselves to anyone else, I'd live quite happily. I just want to ask you a very short question. What do you think the meaning of life is? No real meaning other than we have evolved to be here. Exhibition Road, South Kensington. Perhaps this is where I always am. I was here as a child. I used to go down into the old mine exhibit they had underneath the Science Museum and lose myself down there. So maybe I've never really left that place. You follow the theory of relativity, then human perception of time begins to seem, dare I say it, a very, very relative proposition. Mm -hmm. So there was an eon prior to ours where its infinite future expansion became our Big Bang. Mm. So that's the rubric that I've taken for these programs. We're not following a linear structure in which we present a series of arguments and data and then reach some sort of conclusion, but rather, like the Dutch traffic engineer Hans Mondeman, we're going to create a kind of sound environment in which we hope you, the listener, will make up your own route. I just want to be happy and I, I would like people I interact with to be happy and I want to have fun. I basically don't angst about it too much. Mm. I think about it and I read about what other people think the philosophy, but I just get on and do the best I can. I suppose some people might find it a little bit pathetic that a very eminent scientist, Wendy Hall, just wants to be happy. It's a bit like a kind of popular song from the Depression era. But actually, I find it rather reassuring. After all, it's people like Wendy Hall who actually shape governmental policy and education in the field of technology. And when I look around me at these technological gizmos, I want to believe that all of this stuff in the physical world is also made by people who, in a sense, just want themselves and the rest of us to be happy. That's a tough one. Very quickly, what do you think the meaning of life is? To be happy? Yeah. Being happy with what you have. But I'm not trying to change the world, and well, I know it's out of my uh, of my reach. But but if I can affect the people around me in my everyday life, then that's enough for me. You're totally my kind of a guy. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. I was brought up with the Ten Commandments and that creed, and I was brought up to know right from wrong in that sense. Um, and I think you need that so you can understand why the primitive civilizations needed to develop that. With your background in pure mathematics, do you think that the world is mathematical, or do you think maths is a structure that we impose on reality? I think the world is mathematical. I think there's, it's fundamental truth. That's my. That's the way I see it. If you 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 have the analytic mind, the the, the universe, everything that is, is in some sense resolving itself into a series of acts. Is that the meaning of life then? Um, oh dear, I, I don't understand why we're here. And I, I look to science to explain that. But of course, the paradox is if we did know the answer, we would all be gods and then there's nothing to strive for. Or in a sense, <laughs> if we did know why we were here, it would only be why we were here. Yes. And, and it it's would that. move the whole yes. argument somewhere yes, else. Yes, it does. It, it and would... so no matter how much the physicists explain the Big Bang and, and you know, it's still how did that happen? And I, I love the, the concept of the parallel universes and we exist in all of them and, and all the different routes we could have taken. But it still doesn't explain how all that came about. So, so if, if one accepts one's fundamental ignorance, <laughs> about yeah. the big questions. Yeah. Is it enough to give one's individual life meaning to feel that one is nonetheless moving towards that's, a deeper understanding? That's the take I have on it. I mean, I'm assuming you lost your faith in the actual sky god somewhere along the way. Yeah, there. and I think it was the Biafran War, actually. I, I can remember it distinctly because I was at, at, it's that, that age when you start questioning stuff. And I remember teaching a Sunday school class about how... Oh, I can't remember, one of the parables where someone goes out into the desert and God gives them food mm. to survive. And I'm seeing on the news all these kids dying in Biafra of starvation, thinking, well, if this God I believe in is, is a good God, well, why are they... Do? And, of course, that's that was the beginning of the, the loss of my faith in that sense. Um, yes, because that's the point where if you're going to carry on with religious faith, you, you have, have to it accept... It is faith. It is faith. Well, you have you to have, accept yeah. that the world is a kind of real-time 
moral experiment Absolutely. and we're the guinea pigs. Well, of course, that comes back to, to Douglas Adams. I've always loved the concept that we're actually run by the white mice and mm. we're just an experiment. And if you think about the world I live in today, the, the internet, that is a real live experiment mm. to see what happens when we can all communicate digitally and do everything digitally. But Wendy, where's the control <laughs> well, if exactly. it's an experiment? You see, that, that's, that's the point. No, there isn't, there isn't one. Than that. Here's the plane that all cock and brown first flew the Atlantic in, going into the space galleries. I remember these being inaugurated in the late 1960s. Elements of them are still exactly the same. This scale model of the original lunar landing module with its exciting gold foil wrapping, looking rather like an enormous bonbon. And certainly when I was growing up in the 1960s, the conquest of space seemed to symbolize human Prometheanism, our reach for the stars, and our ability, in a sense, to punch above our weight in the cosmos, on the same level, arguably, with gods. Well, I, I suspect, Susan, yeah. that they think you're a very eminent scientist, mm -hmm. advancing a fairly controversial thesis. So, In my view, it's not controversial. Right, but, yeah. but you know, you, you can imagine that journalists' approach to that is going of to be course. to try and shoot well, you down, of isn't it? Susan Greenfield is a scientist, a writer, and a broadcaster, and she believes we should maybe try and control what we're doing with technology. Because what you're proposing is the concept of neuroplasticity, that, that, that our, our brain stroke minds are actually yeah. changing in yeah. response to our use yeah. of bi-directional yeah. digital media. Indeed. Um, up until you said digital media, everything else is so well established, it's hardly controversial. Everyone agrees and knows and has evidence for that the brain changes every moment you're alive. It's therefore very much interactive and influenced by the immediate environment. Therefore... If the environment is changing, and I argue it is, if it's now reduced to two dimensions, it's a different type of environment. So we may well expect the fact that the brain will adapt to that. Now, that, for me, is not controversial. What I then go on and say is, and therefore we need to explore what we want out of life, which is the meaning of that, mm. yeah? how we want to maximise this technology, how it should be harnessed as not an end in itself, as many have mm. it, but as a means to an end. That begs the question, what do you want? out of life? What do you want to achieve? What do you want your kids to be? What kind of talents do you want them to have? What kind of life do you want them to lead? What kind of people are they going to make up for society? All those questions. And all I'm putting out a call for is to think and talk about those things. Now, I don't see why that is so inflammatory. You know, mm. Unless, of course, you're someone who's making a lot of money out of this and feels threatened mm. by anything that could be perceived as in any way going to detract from people being engaged 18 hours a day as some are well, I think that in is, your product. Yeah. Well, I think that is it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's that pure and simple, but I think it's more diffuse, isn't it? I mean, it's not your individual kind mm. of tech entrepreneur thinks, yeah. oh, that Greenfield, she's knocking yeah. yeah. bi-directional yeah, yeah, digital yeah. media, we'd better have a go at her. Mm. It's more that there is a general attitude in our culture and society mm. that, you know, bigger, better, faster, stronger is necessarily or, or, good. I, no, I agree. Certainly, I think there is a sort of mindset that technology is universally and unequivocally and unconditionally desirable and good. You see, and this saddens me hugely, one- and two-year-olds with iPads, mm. whereas the American Pediatric Society has said children really shouldn't be even having a minute of experience with iPads and screens until the age of two or three. On, yeah. on what basis do they say that? On the basis that their visual system, their sensory motor coordination, and so on, are really underdeveloped. Mm. And if they are restricting their vision and um, having their brains bombarded with this very heavy inputs that there's going to be an issue and a, mm. and a problem. So um, I think it's something we shouldn't be using these kids as guinea pigs, mm. you know, and waiting and then in 30 years' time saying, you know what, I think they were right. They do seem to be, you know, having a problem. As we walk around the Science Museum, as in every public place nowadays, we see people with camera phones out taking photos of themselves, taking photos of their children... There's a sense, I suppose, some people think that this greater connectivity, the web itself, does represent a kind of meaning for human life. That maybe 
Ray Kurzweil of the transhumanist movement is on to something and that our meaning, if you like, is for us all to be linked up into some kind of supra-individual consciousness, maybe even via our phones. <laughs> Dame Wendy, at least, has a great deal of experience to draw on when she's making decisions and formulating theories, whether about law or education. Before the internet even existed, she was working on concepts like connectivity, alongside contemporaries who included the so-called father of the World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee. Can you recall whether at the time you viewed that as an unequivocal good thing, you know, a desideratum <laughs> to be pursued? It's, it's a very interesting question. I was talking about this at a lecture I gave last night because I, I, I said last night I think scientists have a moral obligation to think about the potential harm that their inventions might have as well as the good. Mm. But you're always thinking about the challenge of making it happen technically and or building things to demonstrate what you're talking about to people. And you think always that people are going to use this for the good. You don't think about, you know, someone's going to try and use this to take money or, you know... Yes, uh, and, and even <laughs> scientists in, in situations where you would have thought those questions aren't particularly equivocal, yeah. like, for example, the, the people who worked on the Manhattan Project exactly. still needed to believe that they were involved in doing something that Absolutely. was unequivocally good. Absolutely. And, Which is uh, bizarre, isn't it? It's, well, I don't know what their motivations were or what they were being told they were doing. Because, you know, the idea of uh, nuclear energy is, is a really powerful idea. We, we really, really need that in the world today mm. because that is the best and the cleanest way to deliver energy. And it's that divorce between that and, um, you know, people using nuclear bombs and weapons to kill each other. And But if I read you are right, speaking as a scientist... Mm your personal meaning is in conflict with another area of meaning in your life in the sense that these possible advances, you can't help wanting to make them happen in mm. a way. But your, as it were, metric for, for how you want your life to go, which is mm. you, you want both to contribute to your own happiness and leave things better than they were, mm. may be in conflict with that intense urge to see, can we make this happen? Can this... Mm. And, yeah? and In fact, um, there is this conflict without the work we do on the study of the web, which we call web science. We think of it as co-created or co-constituted between mm. machines and people but um this idea that um we create it but but there is no control over how it works and you've got the commercial forces of the googles and the facebooks who want to make money you know nothing wrong with that but they want it all to go their way you've got governments and nation states wanting to have control of this thing they don't have control of and you see the tension between the east and the west and the extremists and then you've got society wanting to uh, tell everybody what they're doing on Facebook and put the video of their cat up and all the things that, you know, we seem to be... Um, whatever method of communication is invented, we just use it. We're making a programme for the BBC. The You've BBC, got... no, not for me. Not for you. BBC. Don't you like the BBC? What, what programme is that? It's a documentary about the meaning of life. Do you think life's getting more meaningful as we get more connected with things like the World Wide Web and all this fantastic technology you see around you in the Science Museum? Obviously. In terms of commons and everything, I believe it's a brilliant thing. Science is the key. Science is us. That's who we are. From biology, of course. Yeah. Biology to physics to this to that, you know. What about God? How does he fit in? Ah, that's another big question. <laughs> <laughs> Have a, you didn't need this this afternoon, <laughs> did you? Have a lovely afternoon. You Thank you Thank for your you. time. Bye -bye. I think meaning, all right, um, and something that I've thought about a lot in terms of everyday life. You know, mm. like, um, have you got a wedding ring on, for example? You have. I yes. Do, okay, yeah. look, take your wedding ring. So if you showed that wedding ring, to a year old child, it probably wouldn't mean very much. It might mm. be something they want to put in their mouth. It wouldn't mean anything, mm. okay? But as you grow, the kid will learn it's something that goes on fingers. Mm. And then they will learn that something looks like that only goes on one finger mm. under certain circumstances. So then they'll learn, if they see someone, as I'm seeing you with yours on, mm. 
it will mean something that's mm. not intrinsic in the properties of the object itself. Mm. Yeah? Mm. So one can think of meaning or defining meaning as something that has lots of associations or a context which is mm. not apparent by virtue of the sensory properties alone. Okay. okay so so a, if that's the case, yeah. So yeah. meaning of life then, or yeah. the meaning for something, is something that has connections or associations and i think that for a lot of people especially young people the ones you know who are the victims of being bombarded by the screen that if things don't have a lot of context it is literally meaningless um i'm sure you grew up like i did uh, with your mates saying um let's make up a game or you might take a random old box and say this is the house this is the car this is the you know? mm. so there are very low grade props and your little soldiers on my little dolls in the era when we were growing up were pretty you know, un <laughs> unsmart and non-interactive things. If you had them at all, you might decide to draw a picture or climb a tree. Now, what is exciting about that time is you have decided to climb the tree. It hasn't asked you to climb it. The drawing pad hasn't asked you to draw in it. Mm. The making up of the game, if you and I were kids playing Kelpers and Indians, we say, and then you're going to be ambushed, and then I'm going to do this and that. Now, that plot, that narrative, which is in a sense a little mini life, it's coming from inside you. That's what I mean by an inner narrative. It's not imposed by second second hand web designer. Mm. It's coming from you. Now, why that's important? You're developing a robust sense of who you are as opposed to someone else. You're developing a little mini life story in every game you play, which mm. in a sense is a rehearsal for your real life story, real events, how you cope with the unexpected, your friend bashing you on the head, mm. you know, how you cope. And I think that is something that if I was a parent, I'd be worried my kids might not be experiencing so mm. much as mm. my generation. Whereas nowadays, if you are the passive recipient of all this, I think that will make a difference and it'd be interesting to see. Susan Greenfield's perspective could be genuinely frightening because she seems to see meaning as what philosophers call praxis, our involvement with the world and the way we do things with it. But there are other ways of viewing the way we produce meaning. There are, if you like, without sounding like a bit of an old hippie, cosmic forces at work. You see, the present view is that there is the Big Bang and then the universe went on expanding forever. Mm. And the view I'm promoting, that expansion sort of loses track of itself. It's a crazy idea. But it's when there's nothing, no kind of massive material around, it doesn't know how big it is. Mm -hmm. And it becomes the Big Bang of the next eon. There was an eon prior to ours where its infinite future expansion became our Big Bang. There was an eon prior to ours where its infinite future expansion became our Big Bang. There was an eon prior to ours where its infinite future expansion became our Big Bang. Roger Penrose, eminent mathematician, theoretical physicist, cosmologist, and proponent of some quite unusual and radical ideas. You seem to view consciousness as being involved in a collaboration with materiality that creates the universe as we perceive it and even as we kind of measure it scientifically. Well, it's very much, in my view, a part of the physical laws. And there is a huge gap, which is in quantum mechanics itself, because it has a, two procedures, one of which is the way the state of the world evolves, and the other is what's involved in when you make a measurement. Now, what you make a measurement should be just part of the world again. So why isn't a measuring device doing just the same thing as anything else? Why is it suddenly doing something completely different, where it does random things mm. and so on? It's as though it's making choices all the time. Mm. So it's this element which is not actually consistently present in our current theories, mm. which is what I believe is what underlies consciousness. Mm. In quantum theory, as I understand it, but again, I'm a lay person, you know, what quantum theory has to account for is the impact of observation on subatomic particles, which you can only observe them by putting a light source onto them, which necessarily deflects them, or they may or may not be there. Is it too banal and, and uh, simplistic to say that, that maybe human intentionality is, is like a light? That, well, that, let me put know? it a bit differently. See, there are two views that are often expressed, usually the one which is not mine, which is more expressed. Mm. Whereas, it, whereas when a, a system d you know, does one thing or another, it's somehow the responsibility of someone coming and looking at it, and the conscious being comes in, and only at that point 
is the decision made between one or the other. That's not my view. Mm. My view is that the system itself makes that decision. Now, it's making that decision normally in a way which is completely random. It's when a certain amount of mass displacement takes place, mm. then that system reduces itself to one or, or another of alternatives. However, what is involved in consciousness itself, in my view, is an example of this actual process, mm. which is the decisions being made in the material in the brain, which is having at some point to make a decision. Most scientists still shy away from consciousness. Someone wants to it as a CLM, a career limiting move. The problem for many scientists is given the whole of empirical method is predicated on being ruthlessly objective, along comes something that's quintessentially subjective. You can see it becomes tricksy. Yeah? Almost anybody who's philosophically minded reaches the conclusion quite quickly that our senses cannot be entirely veridical. They cannot present us with an entirely truthful picture of the world that surrounds us. I'm colorblind, for example, so my world is pretty colorless. If we can't have this kind of objective understanding of what the world is, how can we find meaning in it? People, I think, flounder because they say you either have consciousness or you don't, it's all or none. Whereas much can be much more happily accommodated if you think that consciousness grows as brains grow, like a dimmer switch. Mm. So a rat will have consciousness, or a jellyfish will have consciousness, mm. but not as much as you or me. And a fetus will have consciousness, but not as much as mm. an adult. Now, once you've done that, note I've been very sneaky, because I've converted something that was ineffable mm. into something. Guess what? It's quantifiable. So you can get a handle on the subjective phenomenon yes. by the objective correlates yes. that are available. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So now we can look in the brain and say, what is there going on in the brain? Give me a shopping list. That mm. Something that is varying in degree from moment to moment. And that's something I've been working on a lot. You used the word microtubules. I don't know if that's correct pronunciation, Roger. Yes, that's right. And you, and you were looking in the brain for evidence of this kind of quantum organization. What did you think you were kind of onto there, exactly? Which I wrote my book, The Emperor's New Mind, mm. which was my first sort of semi-popular uh, attempt. And uh, I thought when I got to the end, I would know the answer of where this quantum coherence could be kept. And I came to the end and I didn't have any answer. But Stuart Hameroff read my book. He, he's a, an American anesthesiologist, so he puts people to sleep professionally. And amongst his colleagues, he's one of the few who actually wants to know what he's doing when he puts them to sleep. What is actually going on in the brain when a, a general anesthetic is applied? And his idea was that the general anesthetics affect these things called microtubules. Now, these are tiny substructures of cells which are present in practically all cells. Mm. And they have all sorts of wonderful properties. They are involved in mitosis, the, the uh, splitting of cells, and they line up all the chromosomes and that sort of thing. And it seemed to me this, this was just the kind of thing which could perhaps preserve this kind of quantum activity. You might need lots of them acting coherently, which is the view that we have. Mm. And that these microtubules could influence the strengths of synapses. Mm -hmm. So that it's, if you like, the brain could be thought of at one level as being like a computer, but it's being changed all the time at mm. a deeper level where the strengths of the connection between one neuron and the next is controlled at a deeper mm. level. And so we got together and have developed these ideas for uh, more than a decade now. And do you feel you're getting somewhere with it? <laughs> uh, he's much more optimistic than I am. And he thinks, oh, well, we're nearly there, you see. I think we're nowhere a long way from being there. But on the other hand, yeah, there are experimental things which, which seem to uh, shed some light on this now. Mm. Our program's about the meaning of life. Do you think you find meaning in science? Yeah, it explains the world around us. But can you explain why we're here and what it's all for? No. It's not going to provide a balm for the soul. No, no. No. But I guess I just accept that. Are you drawn to religion? No. Okay, but you're, you're able at this point in your life to cope with the fact that you haven't got a clue what's going on. Yes. Great. <laughs> Have a fantastic afternoon not having a clue what's going on. If you 
follow the thinking of the French philosopher Alain Badiou, you might be led to believe that mathematics, rather than being a description of the world, or even innate in the world in some way, is the world. You know in pure mathematics if you've got the right answer because it all just fits into place as mm. if it was meant to be. Mm. And if it doesn't fit into place, you're doing something wrong. It's like the title sequence of The Matrix in which everything is just binary code, ones and zeros streaming past the screen. When I talk to, to people who really do maths, they say that it's an aesthetic thrill, primarily. Absolutely. No, that's true. Well, certainly in pure mathematics. I mean, people say, well, you know, isn't it shall be wonderful and build bridges or codes or whatever it mm. is. But that's not why they did it originally. It's, mm. it's, it's curiosity, but something much deeper than that. It's, it, it is this quality of beauty, which it's not just uh, the reason you do it, but it's also an, an amazing tool for discovery. Mm. I mean, you, why do you go in direction A rather than direction B? Well, these are aesthetic judgments which you have to make, which you can't pin down very well in any kind of clear way, except this thing looks much more attractive. If this were true, it would be much more attractive than if that were true. And it's much more likely to be true in that case. But I mean, again, your theories would suggest that if consciousness is an emergent property of the material universe in some fundamental way, in other words, we can't really conceive of the universe without consciousness, it's imminent in, in its yes. physical reality, oh, right. yes. Yes, then right. why wouldn't aesthetics be part of that, in a sense? It's I think like, it is. Yeah. I think it is. But then, in a sense, more difficult question even than, than trying to find out what consciousness is. Mm. I think that there is something extraordinarily subtle about great art. Mm. And, and I do feel that. There is something... It has a purpose of its own. Mm. I don't know why, how I can justify saying that, but I do feel that, yes. You do. I'm inquiring into the meaning of life. People will say, you know, art has replaced religion. Well, if you showed up at the Tate Modern and went down on your knees mm. and said, you know, I don't know what the hell this is about and I'm lost and confused, etc., uh, you'd be ushered out by the security guards. Next week, I'm going to go and talk to the people who think they know the answers. Or at any rate, traditionally, theirs was the discipline that provided them. The need for a meaning in our lives, I think, is actually a sign of human frailty. The philosophers. Do we have no purpose? Are we not here Humans for have anything? a great talent for unhappiness. Mm. Well, I mean, that's not making me any happier either, George. <laughs>